Good morning. Would the congregation please stand for the reading of scripture this morning? Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke 1, verses 46 through 55, Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Some would say it's the most wonderful time of the year. You can hear that song in your head, can't you? Dun, dun, dun. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, is it okay to be happy? Now, I appreciate the one response. Martha, now who knew that Martha Johnson would, would let that question sit that long, right? I love that. I'm a little serious, though. I mean, if you were photographed laughing and carrying on and having a good time, and somebody posted that on their feed... Uh, would you be accused of being tone deaf in 2020 with all the struggling and the pain and everything that's going on? If you were to, in fact, clap along because you feel like a room without a roof, whatever that means, <laughs> is that even okay? I, I know, and I'm not making light of this. We have rightly said, and I am so grateful this has been said, and church is a great place to live this out, but we've made this statement, it's okay to not be okay, and that is absolutely truth. But is it okay to be okay? Is it okay to be happy? Can we talk about joy in this climate with all the suffering going around us? Yes, we can. We can. This morning, we're continuing our journey to rediscover Christmas, despite the challenges, despite the hardships and the pains and the difficulties we might be facing or even only one degree of separation from in our own lives. Christ has come to be God with us, Emmanuel. And because of that, we can experience joy no matter what discouragement we may be going through. If you've got your Bibles, take them and grab them. Turn to Luke chapter number one. If you need a pew Bible, grab that. And uh, if you don't own a Bible, that pew Bible is our gift to you. Take that with you. Um, deacons, take note, though. If they all get gone this Sunday, I've got to replace them for the next Sunday. So Luke chapter number one. I want you to just kind of be ready there at verse five-ish. We'll get there in just a moment. Luke's Christmas story. When I ask you to think about Luke's Christmas story, you probably go with me. You probably go to the King James Version because it's the version most of us memorized as a child. And it came to pass that they went out a decree in those days from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made. And then it goes on and on. And it impresses your grandmother that you have it memorized in the authorized version. It's just a, it's a wonderful thing, right? But Luke's Christmas account actually starts back in chapter 1. And it starts with Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. Luke begins in verse 5, if you'll look with me at verse 5. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years. So they were living right, doing everything right, check, not just checking the boxes. They had a living relationship with God. They were in the right place at the right time, doing the right things, but still had a life marked with discouragement. No child. 
This short paragraph would have spoken volumes of information to Luke's original audience. Look back at the text while I just cover these things. We've, we've got Herod there. Herod. Wow. The Roman king keeping the Jews under harsh Roman control. I know. I know. I know. It's been a tough nine months or so. And, and we've had the government, I say this with, with, I think, the full permission and endorsement of the My Grace Covenant family. We've had the government um, probably do some overreaching. I don't think we would get a pushback in the congregation this morning on that. But we don't know anything about the harsh control that the Romans were exerting on the Jews at this time. It's a whole different ballgame. It's a whole different ballgame with violent oppression in the midst of this, we meet Zechariah and Elizabeth, both of, pre both of priestly lineage. And in a day when a lot of religious corruption and power plays were happening by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Zechariah and Elizabeth were a stark contrast. They were described as righteous and blameless and faithful. And this is especially important in light of what Luke tells us next. Here they are, living right, but they're old. And they've never been able to have children. And then God interrupts. Verse 13, the text says, an angel appears to him. Zechariah had gone into the temple to handle his priestly duties. And the archangel Gabriel shows up to tell Zechariah that his wife is going to have a son. A powerful, prophetic son who will prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Look at the text. The angel said to him, do not be afraid. There it is again. <laughs> We've talked about that, right? How the angels in our plays are lovely to look at. And an angel walks out at a Christmas production. And we all go, oh, right? Because it's somebody's kid. And they look cute. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, the first words out of the angel's mouth, almost without fail, is fear not, fear not. They were arrayed for battle. These were the armies of heaven invading earth for a special moment. Gabriel shows up and tells Zechariah he's going to have a son. Don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Wow. Your prayer has been heard? What prayer? What prayer? Could it be that Zechariah had... Prayed that personal prayer for years. God, please give us a child. I'm conscious of the fact that some, even in this building, and certainly some of you watching online right now, may be in the throes of that. Lord, give us a child. Some of you have been told you can't have a child. My wife and I didn't know that we would be able to conceive. The jury's not out anymore. We've got to find love every one of them. But I know what it's like to sit there on the edge of a hospital bed and the nurse come in and say, don't plan for kids for at least five years and take a deep breath as a result of the treatment that I had gone through. We took a deep breath. And she said, go ahead and prepare for it not to be a possibility. They were devastated. And here the angel says, your prayer has been heard. He probably had prayed years long for this desire to bear children. Some people speculate the angels referring to the prayer that was given by Zechariah in the temple, the one whispered by every faithful Jew praying for the coming of the Messiah. I think it could have been both. Because in God's sovereign plan, both are connected. The Messiah is coming and you're getting a kid. I'm going to answer this prayer because there's something bigger happening. The long years of anguish and darkness and year after year with no child likely gave way to a desperate pleading for God to come. There are some requests that you and I pray that seem doable, they seem reachable, they seem like they're no hard thing for God, right? Are you praying some things like that? And then there are some that we pray that we wrap even in cynicism and doubt as if the only time we might see a resolution is when God fully renews and restores the world. Here's an example. We pray for peace on our streets. Newsflash. We know that will only happen when the Prince of Peace fully returns to set everything right. We long for reconciliation among Christians, but we recognize true unity, biblical unity, will only happen around the throne of God with brothers and sisters from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. 
We plead for God to heal sicknesses and the diseases that ravage our loved ones. But we understand that even in this era of advanced medicine and incredible technology, one new virus can shut the world down. We know that only true healing will come when Jesus Christ returns. You may remember the story. Zechariah is overwhelmed as the angel gives him this news update. He can hardly believe it. So the angel says, I see you're struggling to believe it. Here's your sign. (laughs) You won't speak until he's born. So here's Zechariah, totally stoked about having a kid. And he's got to scribble this out and tell everybody. He's got to write it, communicate it in some way, unable to speak. We see that Elizabeth is quicker to believe. Fellas, the jury's not out on that either. Wives just get stuff, always seem to get it before we do. Elizabeth is quicker to believe the news when she becomes pregnant. She says in verse 25, if you still got your Bibles open, Luke 1, 25, she says, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among my people. So here they are. Zechariah and Elizabeth, living right. Zechariah, though, was one of 300 priests in the family of Abijah. He's one of 24 divisions of priests in Israel. He's an ordinary priest. And his wife, a barren woman who had had a lifelong source of pain, sorrow, and shame because she was barren. So this ordinary, nondescript priest... And this woman who's been barren are now quietly rejoicing because of the promise of a baby. When you think about the joy of the Lord being your strength, I wonder what you think. Do you think somebody that's always kind of like heavily caffeinated and it's sunshine all the time, happy always? Well, sometimes that's the case, right? You've been happy like that. And sometimes it's joy that just kind of bubbles right at the surface. It's a quiet joy. I think that's probably what we see here in this part of the joy. They're rejoicing. If we were watching this on a movie, the sign would come up now. Meanwhile, in Galilee, six months into the pregnancy, Gabriel makes another earthly appearance, this time to Mary, to deliver this pregnancy announcement. Mary receives the news gracefully and willingly, but at some point early on, Mary has got to be doing the math in her head. Oh, wait, before long, I'm going to start showing, and I've got to tell people, watch this, I haven't been unfaithful. Okay. This had never happened before. She's pregnant, and she said, no, 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 I haven't been with a man. She's, I'm sure doing the math in her head. And, and then... And then she's got to tell people, have you processed this when you think about the Christmas story? Because we romanticize a lot of it. But have you thought about the scorn and the shame that she would face, her family and her fiance as well? Have you imagined how would you make people believe that the baby in your womb is the son of God? (laughs) Oh, not only was I not unfaithful, it's God's son, right? Hashtag I believe. I don't know how that works. I don't know how convincing that is. Even Joseph couldn't believe it at first, and he loved her. Matthew tells us that Joseph planned to break off their engagement, which would have been the equivalent of divorce. Mary's journey was not an easy one. Maybe that's why she, Luke 1, 39, see the Christmas story playing out before we get to Luke 2? She hurries off, that's the word, she hurries off to a town in the hill country of Judea, Where's she going? She's going to see Elizabeth. Why? Because she probably thought to herself, if anyone can understand, it has to be Elizabeth. If she thought that, she was right. It brings us to our first point. Joy erupts here right in the middle of discouragement, disgrace, grief, shame. Joy comes bursting through for these two mothers to be. Oh, church family, can I tell you, even in a world that is long laid with sin and error pining, it's okay to be joyful, and to be happy. It's okay to be joyful and to be happy because of what Christ has done. Our text is right there. It's already been read. It comes from 
It's the preamble, really, to the Magnificent. It's when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, verses 41, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she says with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. See that exclamation point there? She's not, this isn't quiet joy anymore. She cried with a loud cry. I love it. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Zechariah and Elizabeth rejoiced quietly at their good fortune. But joy overflowed when the news of Jesus came. Joy and happiness are contagious. Because Mary responds in the very next moment we see this. She must have been so relieved that she didn't have to explain herself or worry about being misunderstood. Before I get there, just a side note. The church is a beautiful place for this to happen. This is the beauty of going all in with your church family. This is the beauty of being more than just an attender. When you're in a covenant relationship with a biblical community, a biblical church family, they will rejoice with you when you rejoice, even if their world is crumbling. I don't have to have all my ducks in a row to get happy if you're happy. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are in this together. I'm going to weep with you when you weep, but I'm going to rejoice with you when you rejoice. Mary responds. Let's look at the first three verses. They've already been read. But look, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy in his, his name. They're still suffering all around them. There's still the Roman oppression. There's still crooked Pharisees and Sadducees. She's still got to go back and explain herself. But she's rejoicing. She's, she's having joy and happiness in the moment. Now, you probably heard joy described in contrast to happiness. If you've been in church for a while, we Christians often do that. The two get split, happiness being secular and less valuable or fulfilling, and joy being very spiritual and more important or fulfilling. Ring a bell? I don't want happiness. Then you take it off because you're a little pretentious, you'd say, I'd like joy. <laughs> right? Makes you sound spiritual. And, you, know, you get to kind of, it's good to want joy. We want both, actually. Here's the deal, though. The Bible, the Bible makes no such distinction there between the words. I just want to tell you that. There are some cultural distinctions, and I want to acknowledge those. But the Bible makes no such distinctions between joy and happiness in that way. In fact, there are simply different words that say the same thing. They may have slightly different nuances, as synonyms often do. But those are cultural, and they shift. The original Hebrew and Greek terms used in the Bible to describe joy and happiness are inter. Changeable. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that to tell you this morning because some of you need to hear this. It's okay to want to be happy and to want to be joyful. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to enjoy those emotions. There's great joy in the Christmas season. It's good to embrace and celebrate the joy that we have in the Lord. To those of you who find yourself driven by obligation and busyness, and guilt in this season, your pastor this morning is giving you permission. It is okay to stop and to say no and pause and take a moment and embrace the part of the season that brings you happiness and joy. And to those of you who find Christmas to be a painful, difficult season, to those of you who are hurting, and grieving personally or feeling discouraged by this tumultuous last year that we've been going through and to those of you who are happy to revel in the season to both of you it's okay to embrace joy God sees you no matter where you are on the emotional spectrum but this is good news of great joy to all people 
Our longing for happiness and joy is a natural desire that God has placed within us as a reflection of his own joyful nature. So don't get all hung up on distinguishing between joy and happiness. Get hung up on the source of your joy and your happiness, which brings us to the second point this morning. Joy can be our strength. Joy is our strength. There's a great example of this in Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Nehemiah, you remember, uh, was one of the Old Testament leaders who got permission from King Artaxerxes to return from exile from Babylon to go and restore the walls of Jerusalem that were in disrepair. In chapter 8 of Nehemiah, though, we learn that this is much more than a rebuilding of a city. It's actually the spiritual awakening of a people. This was revival. I don't know how else to say it. They get there, Nehemiah in chapter 8 has the book of the law brought back out and read before the people. And then the people begin to respond with weeping. Now, I'd love to tell you there were tears of joy because they were hearing the word of God. Like some of you weep when I've preached more than 31 minutes. Anyway, but they were not that. They were probably conviction and the people feeling the guilt and the shame and the weight of their rebellion against the holy God. So what did Nehemiah do? Did he grab his belt buckle and, you know, turn and bear down on them harder, right? Because they felt it. Did he go for the jugular? <laughs> No, actually, in Nehemiah 8, verse 10, here's what Nehemiah says in the midst of all of their sadness. He makes this statement, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Don't grieve, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. What? Nehemiah is saying, this is a time for great joy and happiness. God has brought us back. He's restoring our hearts. He's restoring our buildings too. But his joy will fuel and sustain us. Church, this morning, our true source of happiness and joy and fulfillment comes only from Christ. That's the only kind that remains. This kind of joy is because the Messiah has brought joy into the world. And provided us the way of ultimate fulfillment and life. Peter would describe it this way. The verse referenced on the screen. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. I mean, he didn't just say rejoice. He said you rejoice with joy. What kind of joy? I go back to that authorized text. Unspeakable and full of glory. The ESV renders it inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Oh, brother or sister this morning, a joy that is unspeakable and filled with glory finds its source in a deep, deep well that is deeper than your pain this morning. We draw from this joy well that is deeper than our sorrow. It is, it is even deeper than the problems that look like they're about to bury us. It is a deep well that we draw from, no matter what we're facing. This is not a don't worry, be happy, or put on a plastic smile, or fake it till you make it kind of joy. Sometimes it comes in like a rushing fountain erupting from our spirits. Other times, it's like a thick, slow bubble to the surface. Wherever you find yourself today, let me encourage you that the joy of the Lord can be your strength no matter what you're facing, which leads us to our final point. Here's the challenge, right? Of all the things you can choose, I want to challenge you to choose joy. If you keep filling up your mind with the zeitgeist of the news and everything going on, it's going to be difficult. If you have an obsession with doom scrolling, it's going to be difficult. I'm challenging this morning to choose joy. The word rejoice is used a lot in the Bible, but very little in our culture. It's joy in verb form. It's the action of feeling or expressing joy or delight. It's a return to joy. Re, where's Tucker? Tucker and I were talking about the re 
prefix this week, weren't we? The re, it means to go back to, to get back in touch with it. It's a choice. It's an action. For Christians, it's a returning to the source of our joy, not hunting for an emotion or an experience, but returning to Jesus Christ himself. I want to encourage you this morning, take the action regularly, daily. We didn't print off the daily reading guide just to have something to print that was pretty. See if the copier worked. It's an instrument to help you choose joy on a regular basis. Coming back to Jesus, our source of joy. Recalibrate your life daily to the gospel. That's not just your ticket out of hell and into heaven. It's daily we die to self. Daily we exalt Christ. Daily we come to the cross and to the empty tomb and, and, and are made new by that. We need the Lord Jesus. And when you do that, when you die to self and come alive as the Spirit of God animates your life, here's what happens. It refuels your tank. Anybody feel like they're running on empty? Choose joy. It, it restores your strength. Are you tired? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Choose joy. It renews your spirit as you reconnect with the Savior. Now, from this lens, it sheds a lot of light on the passage from James 1, 2 through 4, where he says, count it all, I want to hear you say it, count it all joy. What? Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it all. One more time. Say it for me. Joy? Well, that may be the last thing you want to hear when you are hurting. In fact, from that pew or from that screen you're holding in your hand or watching, joy may seem a million miles away this morning. When you're grieving or depressed or afraid and somebody talks to you about joy, you may pray the prayer like I pray sometimes. Lord, touch them and use my hand. No, just me. But when the pain and the problems seem to be stacked up against you, those are strength takers in your life. You need strength. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our Strength. James isn't necessarily saying be happy about your trials. He's saying find joy in them, in the bigger picture, because we know some things, right? Brother, sister, we know some things. We know, in fact, that for those who love God, that all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, that bigger picture begins and ends with the source, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to close with this beautiful illustration of this from Psalm 13. If you've got your Bibles, do because I've heard you flipping, it sounds great. I love hearing Bibles flipping around. Unless that's candy wrappers, then pick them up off the floor, right? Psalm 13. It's a beautiful illustration. Psalms are a great source of lyric for our hearts and our souls. These psalmists were honest, a bit raw at times with their feelings. And Psalm 13 is a great example of finding joy in our discouragement. This six-verse psalm begins where many of you are right now. Alone, isolated, sad, Afraid, ready to give up? Look at what David says. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? He's spiraling here. But it ends up, watch this. At the end of the verse, it ends up saying, I will sing to the Lord because he had dealt bountifully with me. Now, in six verses, something had to happen in the middle that caused quite a change. What's the linchpin of Psalm 13? Look at verse 5. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. I have trusted in your chesed. We've talked about that. 
that never ending, never stopping, never failing, pursuing after my children kind of love. Better because of your love, I trust you. Simpler, I trust you. Do you trust the Lord this morning? David transitions as he trusts. Do you need to transition this morning? Do you want to find authentic joy? Trust in the Lord. Have you trusted Jesus? If not, you'll chase happiness and chase joy as fleeting emotions, not deep wells. If you haven't trusted Jesus, you can. And on the authority of God's word, he's calling you right now to believe in him, to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. If I were you, I would cry out to the God of creation right now, to the God of this universe, to the God of this Bible. I would cry out and beg him to save. I would ask him to cleanse me of my sin and my rebellion against his ways. And I would ask him to forgive me for resisting his steadfast love. God will change you. He'll make you a new creature. He will give you beauty for ashes and strength for fears, gladness for mourning. He'll give you peace in the midst of your despair. Call on. Jesus today. Now to my brother or sister in Christ who know the Lord, are you trusting him now? Are you rejoicing in your salvation? Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. It's okay to be joyful and happy. We have a compelling reason at the body of Christ to set the standard for joyfulness in this season, right? The joy of the Lord is our strength. We need him for more than just a fleeting emotion. The choice is yours. Out of all the things you can choose this holiday season, this Advent season, this Christmas time, to take you out of 2020, God help us, choose joy. Let's stand together. Would you pray with me? Father, you are good and your mercy endures forever. We're going to lift our voices in song to respond and bring you praise and glory and honor, Lord, because you are worth it. I pray that if some of us came in trying to fake it until we make it with plastic smiles and just trying to get along so we can get on. Oh, God, I pray even now, let these songs light a fire. Let them stoke the fire that you're texted this morning as we choose joy because hope and peace both have names. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we trust you. We rejoice in you. And the church said, amen. Let's sing. Let's rediscover Christmas this year. By embracing joy no matter what we're going through. Let's remember each day the source of our joy. Let's seek our happiness, not in the seasonal trappings and traditions around us, but in the returning constantly to our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of our joy. Let's choose to continue the process of rejoicing despite the pain and the challenges we face. Let's heed the good news of the angel that brought great joy to all of us, a Savior has been born, a Messiah, Christ the King. Here's that verse from Nehemiah 8.10 as a benediction verse for you. Then we're going to sing one more song, okay? So stay standing. Then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say, say, praise be to God. Praise be to God. Amen. Let's sing.